Oh, bird dia kat luar dia. <laughs> Itulah bird. Bird dia kat mana? Luar. <laughs> Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina Muhammadin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa salam. Nawa jita alim wa ta'alim. Wa tadakura wa tadakir wa nafa'u wa lintifa'. Wa lifada wa listifada. Wa alhasla tamasuki bi kitab illahi wa sunnati rasulihi. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam. ودعاء إلى الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى مع لطف وعافية برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إن نسألك علم الذين بالسفيه هاني وهب يغني اللهم إن نسألك علم الذين بالسفيه هاني وهب يغني اللهم إن نسألك علم الذين بالسفيه هاني وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ربنا وجعلنا مسلمين لك من ذل أمة المسلمين لك ربي هب لي من لدنك ذرية طيبة أنك سمع الدعاء ربي جعل هذا البلد الآمن وجدني وبنيه أن عور أصناما ربي جعل ربي جعل مقيم الصلاة ومن ذري ربنا وتقبل الدعاء ربنا أغفر لنا ولوالدي يا رب فلو ولو من ربنا ورحمة ما قم ربي على الصغيرة وشلي ولوالدي يا رب فلو ولو من ربنا يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا هب لي من زوجنا وزوجتك ودعاني جعل من رقاي ماما أبي أوزي عليه الأشكر لأن بقدرتي على متعة علي وعلى والدي وأنا أعمل صالحا ترضاه وأدخلني برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين ربي أوزي عليه الأشكر لأن بقدرتي على متعة علي وعلى والدي وأنا أعمل صالحا ترضاه وأصلح لي في ذرية إني تبت إليك من المسلمين صلى الله عليه وسلم مش عندك إنتشن زي نفتح Right, Alhamdulillah. Okay, we continue with our book, Sintul Iqyan. Bin Kitab Sintul Iqyan, Sharh Al-Bukat Al-Ikhwan wa Rasibyan. Nil Imam Al-Bawsaudan wa Al-Matan Al-Imam Ramni. Intaqalahu min Imam Ghazali. Nafa'na bihim wa bi'alum fi darin ila anqal. Right from the book, uh, the Golden Necklace, right, which is uh, trans, uh, an exp- explanation of the book, uh, training children, right, or the educating children, right, by the great Imam Bal Saudan, right, who took from Imam Ghali, who took from Imam, from Imam Ramli, who took from Imam Ghazali, right, who is the proof of this religion, till where they have said, right, wa. ويكسه لونا بياض القوتن حتى به عن غيره يستغني وإن طالب منقوشا أو ملونا يقول ذاك للنساء لا لنا نيباس أهل الفسق وتخنيس وأحمق وفاجر خبيث ولا ينعم جسمه بملبس طول المدى ولا فراش أملس بل كل ما كانت به خشونا فإنه أخاف للمؤونة يصلب الأعضاء ولا يبالي بالمشي أو بسائر الأعمال تمام Alright, so we're taking this few verses right, that go into the clothing and the bedding of the child right, So as mentioned before, when we speak about the bringing up of a child right, there are four aspects Right. In fact, my husband just showed me today uh, uh, that in MOE, they have the same four aspects when it comes to development of a child. It's interesting enough, it's an, in MOE, because my husband was in MOE. So he actually, uh, it is called, uh, eh, it is called, there's a word for it, they call it, you know, I can't remember what is it right now. Huh? No, it's the, the, there's, a, there's an acronym for it. Right? But basically, it's simply um, uh, physical. Uh, pies, P-I-E-S, Pies <laughs> Physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual Which is interesting, like, interesting enough That they actually have that in under MOE curriculum But I'm not sure if it's um, apparent <laughs> Is it manifesting in the MOE curriculum or not? Yeah, because I know my, in my other class in Jurong right, They were telling me that uh, that in psychology right, They do have it except for the spiritual component right? So they have uh, you know, uh, physical, emotional Intellectual and then they have social, yes, not spiritual. So what's interesting when my husband showed me that in MOE is spiritual and not social, 
interestingly enough, la, because it's supposed to be a secular, you know, uh, oriented thing, so you like you wouldn't really speak about the spiritual aspect of the human being, uh, but the social aspect. I mean, most people would. I mean, it's interesting that I didn't, I didn't even know that Moe, Moe had that as a criteria, you know, to to build a wholesome uh, human being in their education system, la. But of course, we see that what has manifested in because because our education system is uh, money driven, uh, it's economy driven, right? So actually, what you see is basically the preservation of none of these four. I won't even say intellectual, right? Because in intellectual preservation is basically the yearning to continue seeking, right? But the system has killed <laughs> the love for seeking, and very few students actually, you know, go on out of you know out of um, passion, right? Whereas most of them will go on with, to see which is the most money making, right? When it comes to education, it's, it's so sad like, that our education has been reduced to that, that amount. But by physical, also no. It's not. I mean, they have their PE and like, <laughs> they try to implement some physical um, preservation, but emotional is not there. You know, with the rates of depression and anxiety in our children, intellectual definitely not there. Spiritual, you know, almost negligible. Right? So it's subhanallah, you know. But it's interesting that it's there because it's under curriculum development, and so he's like, is there as a guideline? Subhanallah. <laughs> right, so subhanallah. So anyway, so as we mentioned, right, the, 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 the human being is made out of four parts, right? So when it comes to this next few verses, when he speaks about the clothing of the, of the child and the bidding of the child, right, there's a lot of spiritual focus, also physical, right? The physical focus and also the emotional focus. Basically, there's a lot still coming in, right, of the four aspects of the human being. So he says here, right, uh, the, 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 the scholar, he says, uh, Imam Ramli, he says, وَيَكْسُهُ لَوْنَا بَيَادُ الْقُوتَنِي حَتَّى بِهِ أَنَ غَيْرِهِ يَسْتَغْنِي right? So first and foremost, clothe him, right, with something that is, and what he's saying here, white and cotton. Right? What he means is plain, right, plain clothing, cheap clothing, right, do not, and so that he is, he is free, you know, of wanting to have something that's more expensive. Right? And really, it is really a, a big um, disfavor you're doing for your children when you keep emphasizing the, the price of the clothes, you know, because clothing only is well, the ulama say it's, it's just there for you to what? Cover your aura. Right? So why in the world are you, are you splurging on clothes? The most, is the most ridiculous thing, the most foolish thing a human being does is to splurge on clothes. And I know of, of, a, of a woman, she's, subhanAllah, and she's actually one of the asatizas. Right? But her, her abayas, you know, it can go into the hundreds of dollars. Right, that it costs. Right, for me, like, okay, abaya is like, this is $25. Eh? <laughs> like, I mean, like, because abaya, basically, if it's a good cloth, halas, ah. you know, like, why in the world do you, will you actually pay in the hundreds right, to buy an abaya to walk around in? I mean, I'd rather buy a cheap one from Geylang or from, online, there's so many, like, so many online, right, that, that is good enough to cover your outright, and then the rest of the money, you can do a lot of other things. Now you can at least you know work on education. You can you can sedekah lah. You know if you have too much money, you can sedekah. Right then to actually you know use it to to clothe yourself. Right. So it's actually of also it's, it can be said you know of of selfishness. Of there's a lot of things to be said right, about people who you know, when you when you splurge right, on uh, clothing on clothing. Eh. So here he's saying you know really don't splurge on clothing. Be 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 practical about this. Right. And there is a story about this. Uh, you know uh, his name is Bahlul. You know Bahlul, eh, Bohlul lah. He's in Bohlul, right? So in the Malay, they took his name to Bahlul, mean like like you know stupidity or to be stupid. Right, but basically, this Bohlul, he's of the Aulia of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He's not you know just any person. Right, he's of the Aulia. He existed in the time of uh, Khalifa Harun Al Rashid, right? So when Khalifa Harun Al Rashid, you know he was a Khalifa. Bahlul is the brother of you know the Khalifa Harun Al Rashid, and Bahlul, you know he's known to be called Bahlul because he does strange things, right? But his strange things all have meanings. You know, it's not like he's going around randomly, you know, but when they repeat, right? And, and so there was once he was at, at a grave and he was poking on the bones, right, at the grave. And then, uh, you know, some, and Harun al Rashid walked past and he was saying, Why are you doing Bahlul? You know, why, why, what kind of ridiculous things are you doing poking at the bones of graves? And then he said, It's funny, you know, how I can't, I can't, I can't distinguish the king from the pauper, right, amongst these bones. <laughs> you know, like, in a sense, like, as, 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 as a you know, message, lah. Right, that you know you're a khalifa, you're a king, you know, like what are you? But he's Sayyidina Harun al Rashid, he was known to be pious, right? he was righteous. But his brother was a different level altogether. Right. So and I went to his grip when I was in Syria. So he was he would be someone who would say, you know, like he would say to his brother, I fear for you. You know, because like, for me I have one clothing and I eat one day in the morning and one day in the evening and that's gonna be my hisab. That's gonna be what I'm gonna be reckoned with on the year of judgment. It's gonna be a bit you know, difficult for you. Right, with your 50 clothing, you know, with your, how much are you going to answer on the Day of Judgment? 
Like, why do you have this? Why do you need this? Why are you, you know, consuming, consuming, consuming? And we know this, this disease of consumerism has destroyed our world. Like, if you only took what we needed, we would not destroy like, this planet that we are on. It's great. Lah. Right, so here, right, so Imam Ghazali, he says, so, so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's from, from, from a hadith, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said that, ilbisu thiyab al-bayda, right, wa kaffinu fiha mautakum, fa innaha ahabbu thiyab ila Allah ta'ala. Right, so he says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, wear clothes that are white. These are more for men. Right, for women, right, it is basically, uh, they go more on, not to be as not to be attractive, right? In your clothing, right? To try to be as 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 normal as possible, normal. Eh? Right? Don't don't be outstanding in your clothing for women. I right? try not to be, right? Because when you when you are outstanding, you ask yourself, why am I trying to be outstanding, right? In my clothing, right? If you want to be decent, okay, decent. Right? If you want to be acceptable, presentable, okay, fine. Right? But if you want to be, you know, like everybody stare at me and how beautiful I am, you know, like in in a way. Then you are wondering what kind of what's holding in your heart, like why do you want that? And and then when you and then sometimes we we wear something so beautiful, we're expecting the praises coming in. So when the praises come in, you must ask yourself, why am I that? And why am I doing that? And so and from there we have basically basically the the scholars they say that there are many things that are permissible in Islam. We don't say they are not permissible, but when you put them on the scale of why, like why are you doing that? Right, then you're on that why scale, then how many of your answers for that why does it have to do with your akhirat, of your, of your hereafter? Right, so you say, why am I doing that? If all the reasons are of this dunya, right, of this world, then why are you doing it? <laughs> right, because what is of this world will disappear very fast. Right, so and that's why they're, they're teaching your children. Right, when you teach your children, you're like telling them, you know, so, so why do you want to be praised? Why do you want to be, you know, why, why? Right, does it have to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? Right, and from there, they really, you really... Direct your children as to how you live your life, emotional well-being and spiritual well-being. Right? So, like, this kind of books, like, they just, they're so focused. They're so focused. So a lot of things that you're doing in your life, you just, you know, okay, cannot. You know, all these things, all not important, not important, not important. Right. So he says, Hatta bihi an So there's also something in the hadith that uh, clothe yourself with white, meaning plain, right? plain clothing. Wa kafinu fiha mautakum. And do the kafan. Of your disease in white, right? the kafan in white. For in naha ahabu thiab ilangmo. For surely white is the most beloved color to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Allah loves white. But again, we're saying this on the side of men, right? on the side of women, because white for women, right, it could, uh, you know, border on something that's a bit translucent, right. So for women, they tend to go for a darker color, right, because it's not you don't see through, right, uh, her clothing, and you can see into her undergarment. Right, so basically, it's whatever is opaque lah for women, whatever is more opaque right, and less uh, attractive on women. Right. Right. So and libas ahlil ahli fiskay wa taqniisi wa ahmaqin wa fajirin khabisi. Right. So now he says here, and if he was and if this child was to request something more uh, fancy, right? More mangkush is like basically sequined. Right, so if he wants any more, more shiny, more bright, whatever lah. Right, this child, he wants or mula wana means more colorful. Right, he wants something basically more fancy lah. Right, and here remember this sheikh. Right, he is. You might see that. You might see that what he's saying is quite strict, but it is from Imam Ghazali, and it is the way they've been training their children to not be attached to this world. Right, it is their way, right, and it is tried, proof, proved, and it is it is basically proven lah. Right, it is this way. So try not to when he says he wants something that is more elaborate, more more colorful, more 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 fancy lah. Right? Why? Right? To show off lah, to show off, to be to be to be outstanding in in your dressing. Basically, he is putting emphasis on how he is dressed, whereas the religion puts emphasis on your character. Right? So you tell them you want to be outstanding, you want to be you want to 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 to, to be above the rest. Then Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the says in the hadith that Allah does not look at your physical bodies. Right, rather, he looks at your heart and your actions and your internal and, and, and your amal, your amal. So from there, you direct them that what is important, right? Not your out, not your outer clothing, right? But your inward reality, right? So he says here that say to them that kalinisa ilalana, right? The kind of like you know like like sparkly things or if it's a boy like it's a boy asking all these things. You say no 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 the girls they wear that, 
like girls, they wear they wear pretty stuff and they wear I mean they wear colorful stuff and they wear more more sparkling stuff. Right? I mean the girls do that. So boys we don't we don't wear that kind of things. Kind of thing. uh, basically it's on the line of it's on the line of training in them, right? Being satisfied with what is simple. Right? And Havi Omar he said that uh, of our ways for women to follow Sayyidina Fatima Zahra, who is the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is of, of the ways of doing so, is that you, you are satisfied with what is simple. Be satisfied. It's enough. What is simple? One shoe, two shoes, enough. Right? We mentioned about that, about, hey, I only have one shoe. <laughs> Actually, now I have two shoes. Someone bought me shoes. Right? So, I mean, like, basically, basically, you know, it's enough. So when they see that, they also learn. Right? So when, and even when you pass away, People will be not, not be will not be so bogged down by the amount of wealth that you have. <laughs> so many clothes and shoes and like bags and don't know what. And you left the world and your descendants all like one or not. She has so many things. <laughs> what are we gonna do with all these things? Right. So if you can, you know, tread and, and it's in the Quran, the believers they tread on this world, on this earth lightly. They don't consume so much and they use things until it's done. Right? And then they get a new one. Right, so don't like, oh, it, but it's, it's a sale, oh, but it's... No, don't teach your kids this kind of mentalities. Right? Enough, you have one shoe, enough. Right? You have one, one shirt, I mean, you have like your, your own clothes, enough. You don't need to have, buy, don't even have to keep buying more and more and more. Right, so off, off that account. Yaqulu eh? right, uh, Alibasu ahli fisqi wa taqnisi wa ahmaqin wa fajirin khabisi. Right, you see that level, eh? Subhanallah. <laughs> this is the clothing of the people of uh, fisq, people of uh, disobedience. Right, fasiq. Fasiq is disobedience. Right, and people of taqnis. Taqnis is basically the cross-dresser. Right, the taqnis is from the khunza. Khunza means the, the bisexual, lah, right, basically. Right, so you don't, you don't copy the way whereby they... They dress. Wa ahmak. Ahmak are the foolish people, the crazy people. Right? Fajr. Fajr are the, are the, the blatant transgressors right? in their dressing. And khabith, like those who are lowly in their, I mean, those who are not, the khabith opposite of salih. They are the wretched right? among society. And what here, you know, the, the commentary, they say that, you know, what he's saying here is that the people of your time, right, those people of your time who are not the best of people, Right. Are you copying the way they dress? Right. And Rasulullah, and there's a hadith where some said that a person, right, he is, a person is with a people whom he imitates. It's a hadith, eh? A person is with a people whom he imitates. Right. So now we look at ourselves. And how much of the people whom, who are we imitating, basically? Because human beings, essentially, we are imitating. Right. We all imitate. Right, so when you look into, when you go into schools and you see that, that not when you're in school, eh, all the fashion trends, what people are wearing, what, who are they imitating? And I always remember Habib Mashur. Right, he is the, the, the Mufti of Tarim. Right, and there was once, and he always has this like every twice a week or something, he has a lesson on the radio right, that is called Ask Those You Know If You Don't Know. Right, it's, part of a, it's a verse from the Quran, like Ask Ahlul Dhikr, like Ask Those Who Know right, When You Don't Know. Right, so people will just call in. Right, it's a radio program. But they call in with their questions. Right? And then he was answer their questions. It's a very beautiful program that they have uh, in, in Tarim. Right? So there was one that I remember someone called in and asked about the dyeing of hair. And it was a man. No, not a woman, eh? a man. Eh? <laughs> he, was asking, he was asking about dyeing of hair. Right? So first and foremost, he gave the law. And the law is clear. It's permissible for as long as the dye does not prevent the water from going into the hair. Right? Because when you want to wash for wudu and for your janaba, right? when from, from your big hadas, right? you have to get the water into, onto the hair. So you answer the fake first. Right? What is the law? The law is clear. Right? If it does not prevent your worship, then it is permissible. And then he went to a higher level. Right? And they said, because there's a law, but I want to ask you, ask the, the question, I want to ask you, why are you dyeing your hair? Ask, you know, what's the, what's the question, the, what, what's the reason? Why are you dyeing your hair? Because he said, okay, if you want to take, you know, henna, right, reddish henna. Okay, if your intention is to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah or something, use henna. Okay, that's, that's, that's high and that's praiseworthy. You want to use henna for, to follow the footsteps of Rasulullah or something, that's high. If you want to go all blonde, right, for example, you found a halal blonde uh, dye, you know, somewhere. You want to go all blonde. Or you want to go all, whatever lah, color that you want, right? Ask yourself why. What's the reason why you're going that color? Are you copying the people who are of that color? Are you not satisfied with the color Allah gave you? 
I mean, what, what, is the, what is the root, you know, of the re- in the reason? And it could be that for a woman, you're colouring your hair because your husband likes that colour. And that becomes space-worthy. Right? It becomes okay if it's halal, eh? that the dye has to be halal. <laughs> it becomes space-worthy if your husband says, oh, that colour's nice on you. Right? Okay lah, so you do it for him. Right? But if, let's say, you, you have that colour, right, so that when your friends come over, then you're, like, going to show off for, I don't know lah, whatever your, your niat. Basically, in Amal Amal, it's niat. Right, your, 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 your intention, right, your actions are only by his intention. So from there, he's saying that, you know, when you teach your child, and he requests, you know, like for example, no, I want to dress like Batman. You know, I want to be like Batman. And now it's something that is this woman. Right, I want to be like Spider-Man. I want to be like, you know, and then my sister be like, eh, hey, but Batman doesn't pray, you know. <laughs> Batman doesn't pray. And then Superman, he wear balls, he wear, he wear his underwear outside his, his pants. <laughs> Don't you see? <laughs> right, and Spider-Man got girlfriend, no. Right, I mean, like, I mean, subhanAllah. <laughs> because, I mean, in the cartoon, it's shown as eh, Spider-Man, he, in the cartoon, he's shown his, like, he's like, they have like, all these, like, women around them. Right, that when the kids watch, it's not, these are, these are not removed from cartoons, if you all realise. So, they are going to see, like, Batman with women and Batman with whatever, and, and these are going to be their, they are role models, right? They are role models, right? So, so like for me, last week you mentioned about the, the princesses, eh? Right? The, the copying of princesses, right? In, and that, that really does stem in the in a woman, right? This inferiority complex when it comes to their body shape, right? Because you know, and, and, and basically what is what is required of a Muslim woman, right? In covering her beauty, right? In in, in dressing modestly. Right, so so they say libas to ahlil fiske wa tahni. See, and of course, you know you have like people copying stars, celebrities, whatsoever. So whenever you have you you your child comes to you, right, with this desire, or you have desire to copy, right, whomsoever that you you love out there. There are hadiths that the, the, a man is whomsoever he loves. So whosoever you love and you copy of the football star, soccer player, whatever. Okay lah, the hadith says you will be with those whom you love. Right, or people are with those whom they imitate. Right, whosoever you imitate, you are of them. So it goes positive and negative. So when you imitate those who are righteous, right, inshallah, you are of them. And Sayyidina Ibn Abbas, he used to, every Arafah, right, uh, on, the, on the ninth of Zuhijjah, he used to go up to the mountains and expose himself to the sun, the heat of the sun, and be in dua and ibtihal and, and, and asking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he says the hadith, whereby Rasulullah said that you are with the people whom you imitate. So he says, I'm imitating those people who are Arafah right now. So I'm imitating what they are doing there in the hope that on this day Allah includes me with them. Right? When He gazes upon them at Arafah. And you see how you know how the Sahaba take the hadith and then they understand it in that way. So they copy right, the people who are. And you saw in another hadith, he says that if you have no you have no helm, if you have no uh, forbearance, then fake your forbearance. Right? Be of the people of forbearance. Because in the hope that you will be of them one day. In hope. Rather than you staying in your anger and your temper and your whatsoever, no. Right? You, you imitate those whom you want to be like. Just imitate it. Fake it in the, in, in the beginning. Inshallah, it becomes a reality at the end. Right? So, in, so, so subhanAllah, Allah subhanAllah, Rasulullah has taught us many, you know, many hadiths that point us towards the danger of imitation. Right? The danger and the blessing of imitation. Right? So think, you know, what are we giving to our children of what they are imitating? Right, so cartoon characters, I don't know lah, all this benda benda eh. Right, uh, 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 celebrities, right, uh, sports players, whatsoever. These are the people by, by saying here, yeah, ahlul fisk, people who are of, uh, of sin, right, of transgression, open transgression. And we know soccer players, they are not of the most, I mean, there are moral ones amongst them, right? But then you do, like, if you read the news, there are those who are very immoral outside of the pitch. And because they're soccer, soccer players, they're not, they're not supposed to be like ulama or whatever, right? So it's up to them, their life. Right? But then, you know, you're going to be loving people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, you know, has said they are doing of the deeds of the people of the hellfire. Right? So how attached are you to them? Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith, right? In hadith, he says that, He says, "Sayyidina Muhammad, in the news, la'an Allahu al-mutashabbihin min al-rijal bin nisa or min al-nisa bin rijal." Right. So there's a hadith that where some says that Allah has cursed the, those of who those men who imitate women and those women who imitate men. That means the cross dresses lah. Right. Allah's curse is on them. 
right? Because they are, uh, they are, they are, they are moving away from the natural state that Allah has placed them in. Right? So also with your girls, lah. You know, your girls just, just you know, treat, teach them, right? About, uh, about Sayyidina Fatima Zahra. Teach them about Sayyidina Aisha. Teach them about about Sayyidina Khadija. So they have good role models that you can aspire to it. Right? Sayyidina Fatima has so much to be said about her as a woman. Right, so much. Sayyidina Aisha, somebody of highest, of very high intellect. Right, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Khadija, right, somebody of sacrifice and selflessness. Right, so and there's so many stories, so many books that now you can find in the English language that you can actually uh, teach your children. Right. So here, then he goes on, right, and and there is a there is also a hadith whereby you know uh, about the woman, eh, about the beauty of a woman. Right, so that you, you know, and it's natural for a girl because when you talk about this book, a lot of it they focus on, on the boy. Right, there is also an entire discussion about the girl. How do you bring up the girl? Because girls naturally, on the point when they are young, right, most girls they like pretty things. Right, there are those that don't like it, right, but most girls like pretty things, you know, flower and like po- unicorns and like ponies and like, it's a very girl thing. Uh, they like all this, and boys are they are very naturally towards like vehicles and like monsters and you know, uh, fire engine, <laughs> and then fire engine. Eh? Right? I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's like you want you wonder how come, eh? Like, is it part of their fitra that Allah makes them like cars <laughs> so much, <laughs> right? and Allah makes girls, you know, like other things. You know, like it's, it's so it's so, it's interesting, right? So the the ulama they they discuss and they say, so how how do you you know you don't want to be so like rigid, right? Against your girls, let them be pretty, right? It's okay. They want to be pretty, then maybe don't. No, 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 no. Zuhu, zuhu, zuhu. Take all the <laughs> like clock and everything. No, 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 no. <laughs> right? No, 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 no. Right? You cause they're, they're girls, right? If they're be- below seven, especially, right? They're gonna be like they're gonna like they, 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 it's natural for a woman to like to be pretty. Is natural, right? And you can teach them that you can be pretty, right? But don't don't always mention the price of things, right? How expensive this is is so expensive, so it's so valued by us because of the prices on it. No, no, you can see, you know, like prettiness, right? Teach them to make the dua of looking into the mirror, right? Whereby the dua of looking into the mirror is Allahumma kama hasan da khalqi fahsin khulqi. Teach them that dua. Right, so that they link their, their beauty outward to that the, what is real for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the beauty inward. So Allah just says, you have made my outward beautiful, make my inward beautiful as well to you. And remind them that Allah loves, that, what, what, that Allah loves beauty. And beauty is good, right? But your true, I mean, your outward beauty as they grow older like, right, is for only your husband. Right? So we don't be someone who goes out and beautify ourselves for the people. Right, that's not you know what we are about. Right, we are somebody you know you, you preserve your beauty for only your husband, right? and that and also you work closely on your you work more on the beauty of your inward heart. Right? So in a sense you you basically you steer the direction, right? but don't be so harsh about it. Don't be so rigid. Don't be so you know. But it's more of soft speaking, so that they will come to their own realization as to what do they want in life. And what do they want to focus on? So basically, this is what I'm saying about, about being too rigid and can turn off your child. As you can see, I mean, we have seen in our, basically, in, like, we have seen people around us. Lah, but the parents are very rigid right, on the child. Right, that it becomes a, a big put off. Right? And you do see in society whereby sometimes parents, they, they impose the, the hijab. And I and for me I, I love the hijab right, on small children. Right? It's, it's so beautiful, okay? so cute, <laughs> so cute. Right? But you know, so so the one is on, on the parents, it's not wajib to put the hijab on your child. Definitely not wajib. It's only wajib after puberty. Right? Definitely. Right? So if it's up to the parent whether they want they want to do it or not, right? But what you should do, right, is to make modesty beloved to them. Right? That is what you should do. Right? Modesty be beloved. Right? Because you don't want to impose a hijab. Right? And then without the talk of Sayyidina Fatima Zahra, without the talk of modesty, without what Allah subhanahu has said about the modest woman. Right? So the love is not there. So when, as they grow older, they begin to hate or despise this hijab. And if you read, you can write a lot online lah, about pe- women lamenting, right? about, about I was forced to wear the hijab when I was young and I hated it and I was always out of place and out with my friends and what, what, what. They were this and, I, and my father was the one who forced me on it. So the moment I grew older, I left it. 
They kind of, you know, like you see this kind of, and, and we don't want to blame them, but we want to see what's the problem. Like, what's the problem? Like, for me, I wish my parents put it on when I was young. We did not. Like, but I wished, you know, they had, they had, you know, made me grow up with it. Right? But, you know, my, mom, my father has his views and my mom has her views and whatever lah. Right? But, you know, for me, if I had a girl, I would put it on her. But again, not shadid. Right? Not so fierce about it. Right? So if she wants to put it off, let her put it off. Right? When she's below, below puberty. Not above puberty. Yeah? <laughs> when she's below puberty, when she wants to wear, wear lah. Don't want to wear, don't wear lah. Right? It's okay. Right? But make it beloved. Right? Make it beloved to them. Right? And, and as they, after the age of seven, especially after the age of seven, Right, the talk must start to, you must start with the talk about hijab right, and about why it's important on us as, as, as Muslim women, how it preserves our dignity and our integrity as Muslim women, right, how it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not about anybody else. Right, it's basically your own journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you know, as well, I, myself and my mother, we like to read all this stuff online lah, of those who left the hijab to understand why. Right, why would a person leave the hijab? And for me now, the niqab is, is beloved to me. Right? So it's, like, it's not even like so much about anything else. It's just, it's just my own, like, I just love it. Right? So, so uh, subhanAllah, the, 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 so when you read, you, 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 need, you need to read. Right? Read what people say because you don't want to fall into the, the mistakes right, that have been made on this woman who left the hijab. Right? So you want to see what was done right about those who brought up the kids on the hijab and then the kids love the hijab and those who did the same thing brought the kids on the hijab but the kids end up hating the hijab. Like what was the thing that was done wrong? And the, the common denominator that you see amongst all these writings right, of women who are now you know, declaring that you know, they're not wearing hijab and it was such an oppression. And blah, blah, blah. You go and read, lah, go and read a lot of articles online of those who left it. Eh? But make sure you read it with a strong faith that the hijab is wajib. Right? Don't like you read it, oh, okay lah, buka. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I'm not trying to. You know, but it's more of like to read, to understand how to parent it. Like how to bring it into the lives of your, of your girls. Right? That, you know, the, the, the covering of the aurat. Right? That it becomes beloved that they would cover their aurat whether you are looking or not. Right? Because we know, I know so many friends leave the house with the hijab at the staircase, buka. Right? Take, take off everything and then go and meet the friends because too ashamed to be with the hijab when they meet their friends. Right? I mean, so many, of, I know so many people and their parents have no clue. But later on in their lives, they come back to it. Right, when they realize. Right, so, so basically, the common denominator of the mistake lah, that we as parents, we make when it comes to the hijab, first thing, imposing without talk. Right, must, ha, wajib. Like, if, you don't do, if you don't wear the hijab, you haram, you go to hellfire. Right, I mean, like, very, very harsh words. How are you going to love the hijab? Right, we're going to be so, you know, dictated, you know, like, like, dictated, dictated on them. Like, just saying, you must wear, if you don't wear, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scold you about it. I'm going to be very angry with you if you don't wear your hijab. That kind of thing. You know, it's very, you're going to not let them, they're going to like the hijab. And that's the first thing. Right? Don't be, and in fact, all laws of Islam. Right? Don't dictate it like that. Right? It has to come with love first. And you are given the entire years before puberty to instill love in this child. Right? So when the laws come at puberty, right, they embrace the laws. Right? So the first seven years, very strongly aqidah. We mentioned this before. First seven years, aqidah, 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 aqidah means belief, 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 belief. Right? Talk about the sahabas, talk about Rasulullah SAW, talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, talk about all the hadiths about, about modesty, about you know, preserving yourself, about how beautiful it is right, to cover up. As, especially after the age of seven, when they begin to be able to understand things at a deeper level. Right? After the age of seven, right? begin the talk. Right? And then, and, 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 and admire right? when they do cover up, admire them. Right, I mean, so there, there is a, you know, a push, right? And then also, uh, let them choose their own hijabs. Make it a beautiful affair. Right? A beautiful affair. Right? And, then, and also, as they grow to the age of nine, because for, for human beings, age of nine onwards, eh, puberty can strike. <laughs> strike eh? Puberty can strike for age of nine onwards for boys and for girls. Right? Both of them. Even for boys. Right? So at nine, she should be prepared. Right, and if you've been talking to her all this while, and that's what my mom used to do to us. Right, so even though my, my father was not for uh, the putting of hijab on girls, like small girls, my father was not for it lah. So my mom never, never did it lah. My mom, my mother is, you know, whatever the father says, you, you obey lah, right? Because it's not a wajib part, right? But the entire time we were growing up, she would talk to us about it. 
Right, so basically, it was ingrained in us that the hijab is wajib. Right, you are going to wear the hijab when you come into puberty. Right, so in a sense, it has been an understood thing. Right, and then she would uh, explain to us what is the aura and everything. It was very gentle. Like very, very gentle. So and in this book, it was going to be said later on that gentleness, it is key. Right? Gentleness beautifies all matters. And harshness makes it ugly, makes it repulsive. Right, that is the the, the main key, right? The or the main fault, right? As to why people leave the hijab because it was given to them, or presented to them in the ugliest of ways, right? in a very repulsive way. So when they grow older, and then they and some of them, you know, if you read, this is a lady lah that she's, she said that uh, the reason why she left the hijab was because she saw the hijab when she was young lah, right? To prove her worth. Some it was very strange idea <laughs> right, that, that this hijab was for me to validate myself right? and then she, as she grew older she realized that oh I could validate myself without the hijab right, so you know in a sense it was a very you know like I, I wouldn't say that hijab is to validate myself right, you know I mean how valid am I <laughs> I mean how I will validate myself is how Allah validates me right? and that we know right, is by your worship and by your taqwa and your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so as you say, you know, parenting is a lot about yourself, your own mentality change, your own mentality development, your own, your own spiritual progress that your child follows your state. You understand? Your child follows your state. So from the very beginning, right, with your, the, the, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His sharia, that will translate to your child. Inshallah. Inshallah. Right? And, and let them understand that this hijab is just an extension of our our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That, that Islam has an entire spectrum of worship. It is one of the worships right, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not at all to validate yourself in society. Right? It's just one of the ta'at, right? one of the obediences. Right? And if you don't do it, then you are disobeying. Right? If you do it, you are obeying. That's all. Right? So and, 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 and to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you increase in obedience and you decrease in Disobedience, there's no other way around it. It's from a hadith itself. Right? You draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by, by what Allah has made uh, nafil, or a bit sunnah on you. You draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more sins, the further you get. As simple as that. Right? So, subhanahu wa how you present the hijab to your, to your girls. Right? But at a, at, a, at a young age, let them, right? if, if account with this, let them have their prettiness eh? if they want to. Right, so pretty hijab, pretty whatever lah. Eh. Kalau they want, if it encourages them, right, but not expensive. Okay, that's that's, that's a big difference, eh? Right, so nice for them to like it, right? Because they're still young and they still don't understand zuhud yet, right? But as they grow older, right, they will begin to understand, right, to stay away from uh from from trying to beautify too much, right? Because beautification at the end of the day in public. Is something that is very worldly. It is of the world. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. And then he now he goes on, right? And he says, right. He goes on and he says that here, uh, Hababa, she mentioned that that as you develop your child's uh, love for beauty, I mean, as you mentioned, lah. Right, that you need to really, really move them towards love of inward beauty. Right, you need to move them towards that. Right, really slowly lah, slowly about akhlaq, about uh, adab, about uh, modesty, about politeness. Right, be a beautiful human being. That is more important for you. Right, and then he goes, wala yun naim jismuhu bimal basin, tulal muda wala firoshin amlasi, bal kulu makanat bihi khushuna, fa inna hu aha akhafu lil mauna. يُصَلِّبُ الْأَعْضَى وَلَا يُبَالِي بِالْمَشِّ أَوْ بِسَا إِرِ الْأَعْمَالِ Right, so now he says here, so don't pamper their bodies, right, with good clothes. Right, don't pamper, eh. So silk, right, it is permissible for women to wear silk, not for men. Right, but, uh, again, ask yourself lah, why are you being clothed in silk? Right, if you are being clothed in silk. <laughs> for me, I don't know uh, what is, I mean, like, we're not silk people in Singapore, eh, are we? No, right? We don't really buy silk. Silk. Is it? I mean, but it's expensive, right? 
and there's enough cloth out there that is comfortable. Eh? Right? You don't have to buy silk. Right? So basically, do not pamper their bodies with, uh, with good clothes, but basically cotton. Right? Something that is simple, light, that you don't have to go all out in the buying of expensive clothes. Actually, now today, because in their, in their time, in their time, they were more sensible that whereby the more comfortable a cloth is, the more expensive. For us, we have the most uncomfortable clothes and they can be the most expensive clothes. Like, I mean, like, sometimes you buy, you buy juba that is so expensive. The cloth is so hot. Right? I mean, like, sometimes you know, our time is such an opposite thing going on. Their time, at least, they make more sense. You know, the more comfortable, the more expensive. Huh? For us, like, like, it's all about outward beauty. So outwardly is beautiful, but when you wear it, it's like the most uncomfortable baju. And then the more the more cheaper the juba, and that is the better the cloth. And then the more more airy, the more light, you know what I'm saying. And you and, and it's actually more of a cheaper juba. So here for us, it's ux, it's the opposite. Right? The more expensive, the the more uncomfortable it is. So for them, the more expensive, the more comfortable it is. Right? In their time now, basically he's saying here that don't pamper your bodies. Don't pamper yourselves. Don't pamper your desires. Right? Simple. Right? As far as possible, not, not to attract attention. As far as possible. Be like everybody else. Right? And it is, it is macro eh, to try to be above everybody else. Right? And it can go into haram right? if you're doing that out of arrogance. Okay? So be like everybody else. Don't try to up right? and be you know, extra. Right, from everybody else. Eh? Right. And then he says here that, so, so he says, ask yourself, right, what do you want? So how about you were saying, you know, if you think of, of your life in this world as a traveler, so you must ask yourself, what do you want for yourself and your family? So when you buy clothes for them, right, just ask yourself, now, what do you want? Right, for yourself and your family, zuhud, right, renunciation of the world is key to living in this world and it's key to happiness in this world. Renunciation of the world. You are destroying your children when you get them whatever they want. Right? And for me, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all for all these like superhero costumes and whatever lah. Like. You can. I'm not saying it's haram. It's not haram. Right? It's not haram as long as it covers the boys outright. Right? But ask lah. Right? What is it for? Right? Why? Right? Why is he dressed up as a superhero all the time? Right? You know, is he subhanallah? Like what? What is it going on? Right. Hmm. Right, and then the princess baju so so lah. Eh? Like, same story lah. Eh? Like why lah? Why? Like, why all of these things? Right, and then he says, and he, and, and Hababa, she was saying that, uh, you know, of the foolishness right, of men is to, is to go after the comfort of this world right, when his resting place is the earth. And all that will cover him is, what, is his kafan. Right, that is, is, is a, of the foolishness, foolishness of men to go after the pomp and the... The beauty of this world and all that is for you is the bed that is for you is your grave, and the clothing that's for you is your white coffin. That's all. Right? So live your life that way, right? Simple, right? And then and 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 your beds. He says here, have them. Don't give them comfortable beds. <laughs> Subhanallah. And the, 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 this poem is so you're like, Subhanallah. <laughs> it's like Imam Ghazali. Remember, it's Imam Ghazali who's speaking here. Right? He's saying Imam Ghazali, no comfortable beds. Why? Why? Because our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not have a comfortable bed. He could if he wanted to. Rasulullah's poverty was chosen. He chose to be poor. He could be rich if he wanted to. Allah gave him a choice. He could be rich. Very much he could be rich. And even when the wealth came in, like from Bahrain, from other parts of the Muslim Empire, there's a lot of wealth. All the wealth he gave out. He never kept anything for himself. And in fact, his, his, you know, if you've ever seen that, there's, there's an exhibition in, in Malaysia on the, the house of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they have it, eh, like they, they make like a replica of his house. And you can go and see in KL. And bring your children eh, you know, as a lesson. I see how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived. And the Sahabas, they were, the day whereby the, 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 there was, a, there was a, I think, the Umayyad Khalifate, they demolished the rooms of the wives of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Remember, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he does not have a house of his own. But each of his wives, they have a room. Right? So he would rotate between rooms. So it says he was not somebody who lived in one particular place, having many things. No. Right? He had very few things to the point where he could just rotate in the, amongst the houses of his wives. Right? So, so when they demolished the, the, the house of his wives, there were people at that time who began to cry. And they were saying that if only they left it there and preserved it and built the mosque around it instead of breaking it down. 
So the Muslims of later times can see how our Prophet lived, right? the simplicity of his life. And Zainal Halil al Basri, he used to live in the house of one of the wives of Rasul Sultan Um Salama. Right? And he would say that I would come into the house, right? and if I were to stand on my tiptoes, I could reach the ceiling. Meaning that it's, and he was a small boy of nine years old, meaning that the houses were all very low. They were not like high ceiling houses, no. Small houses, small room. Sayyidina Aisha, she said that when I prayed, like, I would have to, you know, when he prayed, so Rasul, Rasul prayed, I would have to bend my knees. So he would pray, have enough space to pray in the room. So you remember how small a room his house was. So his methods how? His methods was just basically palm fiber, right, put together. And when he slept and he got up, right, there will be marks on his back. And there was one Sayyidina Aisha, Right, what she did was that she folded the mattress to make it a bit thicker. Right, and by that, he overslept. Right, and he woke up late for his tahajud. And he was very upset right, because the mattress became a bit thicker, that it became more comfortable. Right, and then that made him miss part of his tahajud. Right, so he got very upset right, for doing that and he made it flat again. Right, to make it uh, less comfortable. So for us, you know, we have like the best base, most comfortable. You can sleep. And you one thing, how come I'm not playing with my tahajud? How come I'm not super so, so difficult? Because you're pampering your nafs. Right? You're not, I mean, the bed calls you all the time. You know, like you just, subhanallah, try, try. Like in Tarim, you used to sleep on carpets. Not even mattresses, eh? Like carpets. Like get your, and he said, يُسَلِبُ الْأَعْضَى وَلَا يُبَالِي بِالْمَشِي أَوْ بِسَائِرِ الْأَعْمَالِ It makes your limbs strong. They're saying, it makes your limbs strong right, when you're able to just take floor. Right? No floor or carpet, if any event is your own carpet. Right? So that is called carpet. Lah. Sleep. Learn to sleep there. You don't need a mattress. Right? And if you want, okay, like if you don't want your in laws to complain about you, and what's that? you're like child abuse or something. Eh? <laughs> right? No bed. In fact, really, your children do not need beds. They don't need beds. Maybe if you want mattress, a thin mattress, they can fold nowadays. And now, all the more, it makes more sense because our BTOs are so small. Right? So the BTO, the, the bed, the, the, the room is so small. If you put a bed in there, you cannot pray. Right? How you know, for most BTOs, lah, to put a bed in there means there's no space to pray. Right? So what? Tilam ah. Right? Mattress. It makes more sense. Right? If you want, just put a carpet there. <laughs> no mattress. Right? And without a bed, so many good things are now opened up for you. First and foremost, the hajjud is easier. Subo is easier. Secondly, right, you can fit, you can sleep facing the kibla. I have a bed there. Yeah, that's why. Right. Because if you have a carpet, where's the kibla? Okay, face that way. Right, if you have a bed, you're forced to follow the the how the bed is being positioned. And usually your bed is not kibla direction. If your kibla is you know like this way or something like that, like you wouldn't like put your bed in the middle of the room. Sing it. <laughs> the room is so small. You're gonna put a bed right in the middle and it's and it's, and it's slanted. It's like wasting space. So we usually make our beds towards the corner. And, but that's not the sunnah. The sunnah is what? Qibla. Right? And qibla, you know, basically you die in the, I mean, if you die in your sleep, right, you are facing the qibla. So the sunnah is what faces the qibla. So mattress helps us do that. Right? You can always angle your mattress and you can fold it up thereafter. Right? Carpet is even easier. Right? Just put the pillow there, this way. Right? Qibla. Eh? And sleep on your right. right. So, subhanallah, we are... You know, a lot more eh, to be done. Eh? It's quite common. I mean, someone wants to reward himself or herself for something materialistic. Not to show off, but to just reward himself or herself for the amount of work he has done. Mm. What about something like that? <laughs> if, let's say, somebody wants to... If he is... I mean, depending on his state. Lah, right, your state. So, for example, you are, you are happy about something that happened. I mean, in Islam, if you're happy about the amount of work that you put in for something, you want to reward yourself. Right? Of course, the highest state is that if you want to really reward, you will give sudaka. <laughs> That's the highest state, of course. La. Right? But if you say you want to, like, you know, once in a while, la, I buy for, I treat myself to uh, something you know, luxurious, for example. Eh? Of course, it's not haram. If you ask about haram, it's not haram. Right? But of course, when it comes to zuhud, <laughs> right. So haram is not haram. You are perfect. You are permitted. You are permitted to take your holidays. You know, buy go for a five star once in a while if you want. Right. If you want to buy a nice baju once in a while, that kind of thing, it is permissible. It's permissible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, if you want to really make every dollar count, 
to your akhirat, right, then you think lah. Right, you think for yourself, and then you just decide for yourself lah. But for every person, your state lah. Right, it's your state. So if if you have reached a station whereby you feel you don't really actually feel you need to treat yourself, you know, in a way, like some people they just don't really feel that I need to treat myself. I'm just I'm fine the way things are. Uh, yeah, that's right. So it depends lah. It depends on your state. Uh, it depends on your state. Uh, if it's if it's just it, I mean, then you don't say anything. You actually don't say anything, right? Because amal bin ma'al bin nahyal and munkar is more of what is wajib and what is haram, right? So if they let's say for example that your spouse like okay, he he did well, I mean he got promotion, uh, then now more money coming in. So he said okay, let's buy a new bed, that kind of thing. Let's buy something more uh, luxurious, right? For our katila or for our bed. So, I mean, of course, if you want to just advise a bit, right, then you can just say that, okay, you know what, uh, of course, first and foremost, as it is now, with the promotion, give sedekah. Right? Because the promotion means Allah give you more risk. You, this means you need to give more out of your risk, right, sedekah. Right? And then if the bit is fine, then just say that, you know, what about, why, why not buy for someone? Something dini. Right? So, like, for my husband, I, like, whenever there's, a, there's a, like, more risk coming into our house, so be like, okay, I think your mother needs a, a new washing machine. Because it's old. Like, I think like, it's just like, you just direct it elsewhere yeah, to others, say, to try and let him understand. Or if you think that to buy a bed that they're expensive, it's too extravagant lah. Which I'm like, why, why are you, you know, on that? Right? Uh, or they want to buy a nice car. And I mean, I know, I know husbands, they're all like, you know, talking about buying a nicer car, buying a nicer... If there's a need for it, there's a need for it. Right? But it's more of like, you know, I want a BM. You know, I want a MERS. I want a... Once in my life, I want to own a mist, kind of thing, you know. Then just ask that, like, why are we? Like, just ask him, lah. Like, what, what would be the, the, the intentions behind this car, right? And then if it's not good enough, the intentions. But in a sense, you can't even like say it's wrong if they can afford. If you're buying it, you know, to take more riba, then you can say it's wrong. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to take, cause for cars, Singapore, basically bit lah, eh? right? So if it's if it's, you can just advise. But you can't say it's wrong. You can't say it's wrong. It's advice lah. It's advice. <laughs> it's hard lah. I know it's hard. <laughs> right? But doa lah. It's, it's a state. It's a state. Right? So, and Rasulullah Sallam says in the hadith, إِيَّاكُمْ وَتَنَعْمْ فَإِنَّ عِبَارَ اللَّهِ لَيْسُ بِالْمُتَنَعِمِينَ Right? He says, Rasulullah Sallam, he says that, you know, beware of luxury. <laughs> so, hadith is answering your question. <laughs> right? The hadith says, beware of luxury. For Allah does not love those who pamper themselves with luxury. Subhanallah. No, 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 sorry. The hadith goes, beware of luxury. For surely the servants of Allah are not those who are luxurious. Right? Those who pamper. Right? They are not. But of course, it's a higher level. Right? So you just ask yourself, like, where do you want to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The more of the dunya you consume, the further you are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. That's why this book is the first book they teach children because it's not you can realize it's not really so much about direct parenting as it is about purification of the self so that you can are able to lead your children because you cannot lead them if you are yourself attached right to this dunya right so then uh, and then they say here right about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so there was once uh, Sayyidina Umar and you can teach them. You can teach them about all these hadiths about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So there was one Sayyidina Umar, he came into the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right, and he just got up from his sleep. And Sayyidina Umar saw all the marks of the bed on the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Sayyidina Umar, he began to cry. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw the kings of Persia and the kings of Rome, and I saw, and I saw all of these people of empires. And you are the leader of this great Muslim empire. And you are sleeping on such a mat that leaves marks on your back when you get up. And there's some things in Omar, and he said, that, Oh, Omar, aren't you pleased that for them is the dunya and for us is the akhirah? And the Sahabas, right, they used to weep. Right? There were Sahaba who lived long after some passed away. Right? And he said, uh, Abu Al-As, right? uh, he, no, said, uh, Amr bin Al-As, said, Amr bin As, he was seen on his deathbed. And he was weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. 
And then his son said, "Oh, you know, oh my father, why are you weeping so much? Like you are, you are of the of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You have been promised paradise by being one of the companions. Why are you so? Why are you weeping so much?" And then he said, "Because I see myself, and I see so and so and so and so and so and so, meaning the other Sahabas who died from before, right? those who the Sayyidina Musa bin Umar, those who died from before Islam spread." So I see myself and I see this Sahaba who died from before Islam spread. Right? And they died with nothing. Like a piece of cloth around their waist to cover their aurat. And that is what they died, they died with. And for them, so much is reserved for the Akhirah. And us who live past that, who saw the expression of Islam, who saw the wealth coming to the Muslims, and now we die with things in our hands. And actually he was, he was poor, but he, was, he saw himself as, as being extravagant. Right? With things in our hands, I don't know how much of my reward has been spent in this world and how much is reserved in the next world. Right? So you know, he said, and if only Allah took this away from us, so more can be given to us in the next world. And so you will see that of the ulama, that they don't, some of them they don't take money. Right, because why? They don't want the, 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 the amount of reward in this world right, to be recompensed you know, in this world, to be given to you in this world while you're here. Right, so in, in a sense, it's a, it's a mindset change. La. It's a state. It's a mindset change. But the more you take of the world, the less you get of the next world. And the less you take of this world, the more you get of the next world. Right, so it's really, it's called, it's called Tazkia. It is purification of your self. Eh? Right, so and, 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 and that's how you teach your children. Right, so if you take less chocolate here, and then wait, and then like, like you see, you share your chocolate, you share one chocolate here, Allah will give you like mountains in the next world. Really? Huh? Does that work? <laughs> I know, because they see it now, right? <laughs> right but, but, but as they grow older, as they grow older, three years old, yani, they're still at that state, the state of the, the, the non <laughs> right, But as they grow older, you know, like you, you, you try to, to talk to them. Right, about the more you give of this world, right, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you of the next world. And from there, they will be able to let go of the world. Right, so you see, we, our aim you know, is basically this child. Right, and Hababa says here that this child is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, from the second he enters the world, right, even before that, right, he is a trust unto you. Right, you're going to lead him to be able to be fully functioning adults. Right, who understand at the point they reach adulthood, puberty, eh, they understand the fleetingness of this world right, and the uh, heaviness of the next world. And that's where it's at. Right, so now three-year-old, okay, you know, like start, start small, start small. Right? By the time she's nine, she needs to understand. Eh, nine. <laughs> nine is so near. <laughs> so seven already, eight already, eight already eight, nine. But this book stops at nine years old. Because for them, at nine, they need to understand the matter. And that's why they, they produced the, 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 the men they produced. I mean, if at nine years old, you had the, you said that already, right, the fittingness of this world, what kind of adult would you be? I mean, smile at nine, if you can understand, right, how to work for a next world and not to be born about this world. Like, what kind of maturity is that right, in, in a human being? Right? Subhanallah. So they produce the people they produce because of, you know, from the beginning they we're working on it, right? So and then, uh, right? And then and then and then and some of the scholars have said that do not do not be a slave of this physical body of yours, right? Don't be a slave of this physical body of yours. Your physical body wants nice food, it wants nice clothes, it wants nice bed, right? Don't be a slave of this physical body, right? In fact, there was one alim right, of the past. He one night. He did not wake up for tahajud. And tahajud. <laughs> so one night he woke up, you know, and then he, he didn't get up. Like, he woke up and his body said, his nafs like, said, it's so cold, you know, and the wooded water is so cold, and your blanket so warm, you know, and you don't really have to pray tonight. You pray every night, right? Tonight you don't have to pray. Right, so so by his nafs talking to him like that, now nafs does it every night. Eh? <laughs> he went back to sleep, right, and then he woke up for subo, and he realized he did not pray tahajud for that night, right, and he was so angry with his nafs for fooling him, right, that he punished his nafs. It's like, it's like a war going on. He punished his nafs by telling the nafs, 
no cold water for you for this entire year. That means in the hot, because they go from winter to summer, right? So in the heat of summer, he refused cold water. I refused. Because the nafs likes cold water. Right? So, uh, so, so he punished his nafs by saying, no cold water for you. And there are ulama who do that. So there was this alim, right? He was like, he found difficulty leaving backbiting. Like, not just backbiting, but, but hearing people backbite. So he knows it's a sin. So he punished himself by every day, if you are engaged in backbiting, I mean, you are doing or you are hearing it. So every day you are doing that, the next day you must fast. Punishment, eh? Punishment. Next day must fast. Then after a while, he realized that it's not working because it's easy, it's easy for him to fast. He's not affected by fasting. So he changed his punishment. He said that every time you backbite, you must give up one dinar. Ah, that was painful on him because he was poor. So one dinar each time I must I backbite. Wow. So he couldn't. He, he can't afford that. So that stopped him from the sin altogether. And so then they, 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 they do punish themselves inwardly, you know, to, to make themselves more disciplined. Right? So basically, uh, so here he said, don't be a slave to this physical body of yours. And don't teach your kids to be slaves to their physical bodies. Right? So don't feed their appetites. Right? Don't uh, uh, clothe them in the most expensive of things. Don't buy them expensive things. Right? Simple things. Right? Keep it simple. Right, sometimes we have to think about our, to ourselves how many toys they have, how many, you know, subhanAllah, the amount of things we have accumulated in our, in our homes. Right, we should be thinking, lah, thinking, why? Why do we have all these things in our homes? I know our culture of <coughs> <coughs> buying gifts for birthdays. <coughs> I'm not against it. In fact, I myself <coughs> do buy people gifts. But if you want to make it, if it's part of your practice, to buy them gifts for their birthdays, then make it of the practice that when they get something new, give out what is old. So you don't accumulate. You mentioned this before about Sayyidina Fatima Zahra's, her, her practice. Whenever a new clothing comes, an old one leaves. So you don't accumulate. Right? So the number of toys they have, right? So whenever a new toy comes, give out an old toy. Go, right? Go and give to the poor. Right, do not accumulate. Okay. So, so talking about toys, right? Is it okay to play toys of the other sex? Oh, the other gender. Like your, like for example, boys who want to play with do- dolls, and then <laughs> that what it does. There is a there is a imitation of the other gender, right? So at best, try to if you at best keep it as neutral a toy, like blocks. Can't go wrong with blocks, can? But not all kids like to play blocks, eh? Right? But dolls, I would say not to give them to boys. Because, like, they play the, the boy and the girl. Like, so oh, they play the, the dolls. The exchange, okay, action figure, ah. <laughs> Star Wars, action figure. Yeah, lah. But I know our boy, our little boys like to play with baby, 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 babies. Boys, eh? <laughs> then they push the pram. I mean, it's okay lah, it's okay lah. They're not, they're not trying to be, they're trying to be fathers, right? <laughs> so, training for fatherhood. Eh? <laughs> I mean, it's okay lah. So, it's not girlish in a particular, like, like they begin to play dress up. Uh, right? Masak, masak okay, what? I mean, boys can cook. So, actually, gender toys, there are not many gender, gender toys, right? Are there? Like dollhouse. Oh, dollhouse. Actually, it's okay. See, dollhouse okay. I find dollhouse okay because they have like entire cheater going on. There's a story going on, right? In the dollhouse, it's fine. It's fine. It's creativity, right? But so they don't, they don't, they don't do anything that's transgender, lah. Like, like, like the boy now becomes the daughter or something. And then they play, they play family, right? So as long as you, the boy does not take the role of a woman, that kind of thing, you know, stay. But inshallah, it's all okay. I think, I think it's, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not anything. And girls playing with boys' toys is fine. You don't want to play with cars. It's up to them. I play balls, play with... I mean, it's all... Actually, it's, it's all interchangeable. So I can't think of anything that we really blameworthy except if we dress up as uh, the opposite gender or boys putting on makeup. Uh, if, I mean, I know that they, are, they do put makeup on boys who act and stuff, right? I don't know. I know kindergartens who do. Uh, kindergartens that they put on makeup on the boys when they act in school. Right? So just trying to not agree to that, but... I mean, you see lah. 
right, situation. Right, but basically, try not to imitate the other gender. Right, but I mean, most toys okay. Dolls are okay. <laughs> doll, doll, doll house, doll house. I was in Muhammad. Alright, so he says here, right, so, so the worst thing that you could, you could serve is your physical body, right, and that how much of your life is wasted right, by you trying to fulfill the needs of your physical body. Right? So either the basic needs takes a lot of time. So what more when you go f- more than the basic needs? And how much, you know, you just think to yourself like that, that when the, when the body is pampered, right, when the body is pampered, then what are you going to aim of worship later on? Right? And instead of the benefits of having beds that are, you know, khushuna, khushuna meaning rough, right? rough beds or not so comfortable beds, of the benefits, first and foremost, it strengthens your limbs. And right? for us, you know, we always have, now we always, oh, if I sleep on carpet, I'm aching. Because all this while you never train yourself on sleeping on carpets. Right? But if you do, then it will strengthen your bones. Right? Your joints all will be strengthened. Your, your muscles will be strengthened. Right? Secondly, it will, uh, it will help you with your walking. Right? Walking fast. Right? So your, your soft beds actually weaken your body. Right? So now we have kids that want to walk. They're, they're so weak. And I have like, I met I young, primary school kids to the zoo. Eh? And they were primary six now. I walk a bit, tired. <laughs> Tired, so hot, so subhanallah. <laughs> right, no, strengthen them, strengthen them. Hot, hot lah. Walk, right, walk. Don't, don't, don't stop complaining. I don't want to carry you all the time. Right, walk, especially after the age of five. Eh? I mean, I mean, at four, you're so berat, kan? They're very heavy. You know, keep carrying them around. <laughs> Try to train them right, on, on walking. Right. And then also, it helps you with kiamulen, right, to stand up in the night and pray. Right, and it helps you get closer to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he reminds you that is how the way that was the way he lived. Right, and if he, the greatest man who ever lived, slept on something so coarse, then what about me, someone who's lower than him? Right, why am I pampering myself when my own Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam slept something so coarse? So, yeah, ladies, you can imagine yourself. If you're in the same room with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right, and he's sleeping on his mat, will you go on your bed and sleep? I think none of us would do that, and and none of us you would any wonder why do I dream about him? Like, why do I dream about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Right? You're doing all the non sunnah stuff. You sleep not against towards the qibla. You're not on your right. You don't take your wudu. Your dua are out of, out of the window. Like, and it's just like you know what are you doing? And you want to dream about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Like sunnahs, where are the sunnahs? No sunnahs. Right, so sunnahs, keep the sunnahs strong on, in your life. And then inshallah, he will come to you in your dreams. Right, and you'll be pleased with, with your implementation of the sunnah in your dream. And I know eh, that when you put it that way, you know you will not... I think nobody here will go on the bed if Rasulullah is on the floor. Right, nobody here will actually do that. Can? Yes. Right. And he says here that when your child right, treat. Teach your child, right? To yes. <laughs> right. And then he says, "You said ibul aada wala yibali bil mashi al bisairin aamani." Right? There are there is there are people who have said, right, that of the things of this world, right, are shoes. Eh, shoes. They are of the world. They are of the world. I'm not saying go around without shoes. No, but once in a while. Like once in a while, it is healthy, spiritually and emotionally, to walk in the on the dirt. So if you go to the beach, you go to the beach, lah, eh? right? To walk on on grass, right? On grass, on sand, on soil, right? Every now and then to walk barefoot, right? It does, you know. I know, I know there are a lot of theories about that, right? But it does recenter your spiritual and your emotional self, right? When you allow that, right? So going out into nature, right, is something. That is highly encouraged. Right? If you can do that with your children, going out to nature, letting them know about nature. Right? So don't, don't bring up kids who are so far from, from a natural environment. So that when they go to Malaysia, they're like, oh, so hot, and so thirsty, so richy, so whatever. Don't have that kind of kids. I have people who are hardy. They are strong, hardy. You can go out, can go camping, can go cycling, can go to the, you know. I know some kids, you go to the beach, they are scared of the sand. 
they actually scared of the sand. Right, like they, they, they never seen sand. <laughs> I mean, it's unfortunate lah, but they just scared to walk on the sand. Right, but then get them used. Right, to obviously there is a hadith about that. They says that the, that the dirt is the mazra'a of the child. Basically, the dirt is where the child grows. Let them grow on dirt. Right, play with sand. Right, it is it is very healthy to play with sand. Right, that is where they grow up. <coughs> Right, and then he says, "Fayam bagi li di, din ani ani yahfadu auladahum an al makhalit al makhalita misul haula li alla tamil alla tamila tibaahum ila mahum alaihi min ishq min 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 ishq al dunya alla di yusabibuhu qal Sheikh Abdullah bin Alawi al Haddad nafagna Allahu bihi fi fi fihim innahum talabu kulla shayin." وَدَّعُوا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَاتَهُمْ كُلُّ شَيْءٍ Right, so here he says here that it is only incumbent upon the person who is holding on to this religion. So if you claim to hold on to Islam, right, that you protect your children right, from mixing with people who prioritize this world. Right, that means because it's going to be an influence. Right, so when they are with their friends who keep talking about clothes, talking about, you know, look at what I have, you know, talking about things, right? So that is something that you want to protect your child from, right? Protect them from that, right? So that they don't, and he says, and he says here, so they don't, they don't lean towards or be inclined towards their character and right? the character of prioritizing things. So for example, you know, here they have friends who basically, they're always talking about fashion, Right, latest fashion, latest clothes, latest, latest shoes, whatever lah. Eh, they always obsess about the physical world. Right, it will teach your child to obsess about the physical world. Right, so just basically you need to impose, you know, implement in them that this physical world is not important at all. Right, and then Imam Hadad say that these people, right, they seek everything of the world. Right, and they call for everything of the world. So therefore, they lose everything of this world and the next world. Umul Haddad, eh? Right? So they, 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 they seek everything in this world. They call for all in this world. So therefore, they lose everything in this world and the next world. Right? So they were, you know, uh, That means it, they are lost from everything. Because they are too obsessed seeking everything. And the ulama, they say that if you seek of this dunya, right, you will have nothing. But when you leave this dunya, the dunya will come after you. I mean, they try to, 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 to get you. And Imam Ghazali, he said that, Right, so وَكِيَارٍ وَمَجَانَ إِنَّمَا يُحْفَذُ عَنْ ذَلِكَ بِحُسْنِ الْأَدَبِ right. So Imam Ghazali, he says here that if a child is neglected on this aspect right, of his love or attention to the dunya, if he is neglected, eh, if you are neglected on this aspect of being, of, of his growing attached to the dunya, then Imam Ghazali said most of them, right, they will grow up right, to be People of very low akhlaq. People of very low character. Right? Because the dunya, it makes you ugly. Right? So because you are so obsessed about something that is temporal, that you are terrible to other people. Right? And then he says that any, any will lead them right, to being liars. Because those who see the dunya, they will lie to get the dunya. If you see the akhirah, you won't lie. Right? So you become liars. And those who are envious, Right, because you are you are so in love with this dunya that when you see other people, what comes out? Envy. You just envy the beauty of, of that person. You envy their clothes. You envy their houses. You envy their cars. You envy everything about people who are around you. And that will make you depressed. Right, because everybody seems to have it better than you. Right, whereas you have, I mean, subhanAllah, envy, envy destroys the shukur in a human being. Right, so the attention to dunya will, 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 will give birth, will give rise to envy in the heart of a person. And Imam Ghazali says, 
and 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 someone who is a thief. So even worse than that. And so because of the love of dunya, your akhlaq becomes terrible. Because of love of dunya, you become liars. Because you want to achieve achieve a dunya, you become envious. Right? Because you see the dunya on everybody else, and then it can lead you to becoming a a thief. Right? Whereby you take the dunya from other people. Namaman, namam. You say in Malay a batu api. Right? Batu api basically a namam is somebody. A namam is somebody who who spreads news to make people fight. That's a namam. Right? So it could be happen in the workplace. So in the workplace, if you love your dunya so much, you might be somebody. Right, who will spread news about your colleague to make him not get the promotion? I mean, it's a sort of And in the hadith, the namam will never smell paradise, ever. Right, the one who goes around person to person, making the name of somebody else ugly, right, or making them fight whatsoever. That person never smells paradise. Right, and how many people we know go around whispering to their friends about somebody else? Right, to make them hate that person. That's called a namam. Right? And that is of the worst of sins of the tongue. Right? It's even worse than backbiting. Riba. It's even worse eh, than namam. And lujum, right? people who are uh, insistent on their ways. Right? People who love dunya, they're, they're, very, they're very, very stubborn, very selfish, right? very disliked. Right? The fudulin wa dahkin. Right? Those who... Fudul is basically a busybody. Right? You know, involved in anybody else's affair, right? So basically, somebody and somebody in the ulama said, if you are somebody who's a busybody, somebody who's like kepola, eh, like fudul, that means for you to be able to be fudul, it means you are not taking care of your own affairs. And what that means is that it's a hadith whereby Rasulullah said that min husni min husni Islam al mar'i tarkuhu ma la yani, right? From the beauty of a person's Islam is him leaving. What does not concern him? Right, that means the entire affair of busy boyness lah. It doesn't concern you. And the ulama say that why is this hadith that way? Why does it mean that the, from the beauty of someone's Islam is him leaving what does not concern him? The ulama say is because if you were indeed, if you were indeed concerned about what concerns you, you will have no time for what does not concern you. And the very fact that you have time for what does not concern you, that means you are neglecting what concerns you. Right? It's, it's a proof. It's a proof. Right? If, you, if you have fine time eh, to have fudul, to kepo, right? that means you are neglecting some of your wajibat. Confirm. You are neglecting. Right? So, so it is on us, you know, that you don't, that if somebody who is of the, the world, the dunya, right, they will always find out, oh, what is the latest car she has? Or what kind of house she has? Or what kind of... You know, they they were kind of find out what kind of, what kind of like things that you have behind closed doors, right? Because they want to find out and then they want to compare their dunya to your dunya, right? So they basically they are, they are basically going into issues whereby it is, it's going to make them ugly lah as a human being. So Imam Ghazali is saying that you know, so from the very beginning, right, have their upbringing, right, on the living of this world, right? So that at the end. They will not be people of such ugliness inwardly and outwardly, and people who are laughing too much, right? So people who are of this world, frivolity lah, frivolity and of lepa, of whatever lah, wasting money, buying all kinds of nonsense with their money. And as parents, eh, it is incumbent on you to control the spending of your child. So if you're giving pocket money to those who are in primary school. Right, do take note of how much the food in the primary school costs, and don't give them too much. Right, you are actually it is it is it is an oppression to give children too much money, because they will learn to waste, right, waste their money, right? and they will buy all kinds of nonsense. And I had when I was in primary school, my mother gave us sixty cents, eh? sixty cents for primary school. In right, secondary school, she gave us $3 lah because we have lunch in primary school. Right, so basically, I have friends in primary school, their parents give them $10 a day. Ten, too much money, eh, all. Right, $10 a day, that's $3,000 a month on pocket money. Right, what's their gaji? Eh? What's their income? Right, I mean, now you think about it. I have a friend, $10 a day right, on pocket money. So what did this guy do? I mean, one of my classmates, what did, she, what did he do? He buy all kinds of nonsense from the bookshop. 
So go bookshop buy this this notebook that notebook that stationery don't know what nonsense he buy and the 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 food in the in the tuck shop also buy all kind of nonsense food like and then throw away waste like tear tear the paper make aeroplane make you know what all all the parents money wasted into don't know what nonsense that they are doing right so as parents right hold hold the money right don't just give them free style right primary school right if you can if you can eh, pack the food for them if you can. I pack, bring to school, eat in school. You don't need money at all to touch. Right? If, yes. <laughs> right? And in uh, in secondary school, right? If you if you want them, if you can't pack for them, then and because packing also it has your baraka in it, inshallah, your doas, healthy food, you know, nutritious food. Then what they are buying in because I think I think now I'm not sure whether they they are more strict now because back then they used to sell uh, junk food. In primary school and secondary school, I think they are more strict now about junk food. I I hope so. I hope they are. Right? In my time, you can you can buy all kinds of keropok and chocolate in your, in your primary school, right? I mean, but now I think they are yeah they are more strict on it eh? on the on the health. Right? But of course the 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 baraka are the blessings right? in food. Right? If you want to pack for them, you can pack for them. Then they can eat in school, right? Uh, but don't give them so much money and even their high raya money. So they get they get money from Hari Raya, right? You keep for them, right? Don't just let them use it to just buy nonsense. If you want like, after Hari Raya, if you want like a treat, you know, to buy like a toy every Hari Raya or something with the money, then you can have it as a treat. But at the same time, if you want to buy something new, you must give away something old, right? So to as to teach them lah that we don't accumulate things in this dunya, right? So, <clears throat> and so Imam Ghazali he says that you know, uh, and he says that for surely. For surely, the only thing that will protect your child right, as they go through this world is for them to have good adab. Right, good adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you don't prize this world so high because Allah says this world is something less than the wing of a mosquito. Right, it's something more despised than the wing of a mosquito. Right, so that you have, your adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has said this world is low. So you take it as low. You don't take it as something that is of importance, right? And he says, and in the hadith, he says that ilbas al khashin al dayiq hatta la yajid al azz wal fakhru fika masagan. Right? So he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in the hadith that wear clothes that are rough, that are coarse, right? That are you know not like he said here dayiq. Dayiq meaning like not. Not those kind of flare clothes whereby the kings have, right? But normal, you know, normal clothing, not to stand out. Right? And he said, for so that you don't, he said, and do that, do, do it this way so that you don't find pride, you know, or any form of uh, nobility over your own peers. I right? mean, wear something that is like everybody else. Like right? don't try to be extra right, about what you wear, and don't spend so much money right, on what you wear. Right. And he says here, right, that about 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 about, about blessings, eh? And of course, when you when you do all of these things, you have your intentions as to, as to why you're just giving them something that is simple to sleep on, simple clothing. There was one of the scholars of the past. He was he used to wear. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. His name was in my head when you went. Basically, he used to wear rough clothing, I on the inside. Of his outer clothing, right? Because of his time, of his time, people would only respect you as an ulama if you wore something that was, uh, you know, of the time lah, right? So, but at the same time, he's the one to pamper his body, so he used to wear very rough clothing on the inside of his outer clothing. So that, so see, see the intention here. So the intention is not to show off, right? But the intention is. So that people listen to you, right, when you preach. And my teacher in Tarim she was saying the same thing when she goes to Sanaa. Because in Tarim they are very simple, the way they are as people. Right? They are very simple. They are very, uh, very humble right, in the way they dress and you know, whatsoever. But she said when she goes to Sanaa or she goes to Abu Dhabi, right, it's like Abu Dhabi, different story altogether. Because the people in Abu Dhabi they are people of wealth, right, and they will not listen to you as a preacher. If you're gonna come with something that is lesser, right? So they will have like one clothing <laughs> that is a bit up, 
to be with the people so that they will listen right, to you. Right? Otherwise, they will not respect you at all. Right? So it's something, it's something that, you know, subhanAllah, they, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wisdom that you have. Right? So when you see the people, you understand the people as long as you don't compromise on your religion. Right? On your religion. Right? So from there, they, 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 they draw the lines. Lah. The lines right? as to what, what can you wear. So for us, when you go to wedding. Right, so that the adapt of our culture at weddings, you do dress up a bit, but not so much. Don't be extra about it. Right? Hai Raya also same thing. Dress up a bit, but not so much. You don't have to go expensive about it. It can be cheap. You don't have to be so expensive about it. Right? So basically, understand the rule of thumb. Eh? You don't. You basically you don't be more than the people. So you don't action. Eh? You don't be proud in front of the people. Right? Just be. Just be normal. Normal. So you can you can even say about our weddings, eh? Because like uh, the scholars or uh, they say that you have your weddings like the people. That means don't try to be outstanding in your wedding. Have it normal, right? I mean normal, normal wedding, right? And and focus most of the money to go to feeding the people, right? Not to deck yourselves up, right? But more most of the money is going to feeding the people, and if possible, everything else decent. Just, just normal, right? If you can, less than that, less than that lah, right? But don't try to, you know, this, this thing about, you know, trying to outdo other people, right? That is not part of our religion, eh? Trying to outdo other people in trying to make it more fancy, right? More expensive, more whatsoever, no. Right? But something decent, right? In a way. Okay. Yeah, all this talk about, about Zuhud is a bit, it's heavy, eh? Right, it's Zuhud. But inshallah, uh, zuhud is basic. It is it is the detachment of the heart from the world. Right? There are ulama who do they do have like they have a lot of uh, belongings, right? But they say, right? And this one of the one of these alims is uh, Sayyidina uh, Hussein bin Sayyidina Abu Bakr uh, bin Salim, and one of the big scholars and and most of Allah subhanahu wa taala in Hadramaut. Right? He Allah subhanahu wa taala opened up a dunya for him. He had so much wealth. Right, and people will come to you and say that you are you are a great imam and a great sheikh and a great wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, how come you have so much wealth? And he said, Allah opened up for me. If it goes off, I wouldn't even blink. I don't care about all this wealth. So be that. Right, be that. And there was a story about when we end there. There's a story about a man who was a student of his sheikh. And his sheikh was somebody who wore like coarse clothing and ate like the the, the, the driest of food. And this is a very small shed, right? And, and he was a student of the student. He was a student of the Shay. So once the Shay said, you know, go, he said, I'm going to this, to this country. Uh, do you want anything for me? And the Shay said, oh yes, that country has my Shay. Right? Can you go to my Shay and give him my salam? Right? So, right? So, so, so this man, he went to this country, right? And he went to find the Shay of this of Shay. Lah. So eventually he found a huge palace right, with so much you know, dunya lah, so called. So when he entered it and he found the shade, you know, on a, on a, a great bed and like food and whatsoever, and he was thinking this is something that's not right because my shade is somebody who is not of the dunya and his shade is so of the dunya and he was like, he didn't like it. Right, so he, he, he went back to his shade and he reported, he said, shade, are you sure that's your shade? Right, and she said, yes, that's my Shay. Then he said, no, what did my Shay say to you? Because he asked for advice. So your Shay said to me to tell you, right, to detach from the dunya. Which I find very ironic. You know, like, like how in the world can, can he tell you to detach? And then his Shay began to cry. And he said, that it's true, it's true. Right, because even though my Shay lives in whatever he lives in, he has no attachment to whatever he has. If he goes off in one split, in one instant, he will not even bat an eyelid. But for me, I still desire right, the, the, the luxury of this dunya. I still have it in my heart. I still want it. And so that's why he's saying here to, 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 to have this not wanting of the dunya. And so from young, you, you, you train them. But as they grow older, as you mentioned, there has to be talk. You must talk. Right? Because you don't want them to grow up without all of these things. But in their hearts, they, they desire all of these things. Right? So you want there to be talk so that they understand that we don't run after all of these things. These are things, basically the most foolish things that human beings do. Okay, any questions?
Inshallah, next week we'll go to Tamiz. So this is the this is the the the, 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 the years before Tamiz, eh? So it's from now we're at from the age of two to six. I would say six, two to six. Right? But this continues throughout life. Right? From two to six is all physical. Right? As they go older, it's gonna be more verbal. Right? more verbal tarbiya. Right? Or for your children. Eh? Any um questions? No questions. Alright, <laughs> سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب لك صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم